Welcome to Triangle B and I. Today's show is brought to you by Simply Done Concierge. Folks, getting busy now. School has started. Uh, may have some more things to do, some more errands to run, more games and uh, after school competitions to be part of. So you need to make sure you get your stuff done. That's what the team at Simply Done Concierge is ready to help you with. If you will go to simplydoneconcierge.com, let us know how we can help you, and we'll be on the way to helping you be in two places at once. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Manning. Uh, welcome to Triangle B&I. Uh, each week, we bring you a local small business success story. If you are not familiar with B&I, it's Business Networking International, the world's largest networking organization. Our little slice of heaven here in the Triangle, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, and the surrounding towns. There are 33 chapters and about 580 members get together each week, and our goal is to help each other grow our businesses. Our local small business success story this week is Kelly Siphon with Clove Hitch Behavior. Kelly is a visitor host in Triangle North. They meet Wednesday mornings at 1130 at the Youngsville Gun Club. A uh, brand new chapter about, uh, I think about eight or nine weeks in. Uh, Kelly, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Mike. I'm doing great. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Got a bunch to talk about. Kelly is a counselor and psychotherapist. Uh, behavior therapy, the way she describes her business. I think I got this right, Kelly. Behavior therapy in an outdoor setting for all ages. Change behavior. Protect the spirit. That's correct. Yes, I have that counselor psychotherapy seat, and I am a behavior analyst working in a farm setting. Uh, are people careful what they share with you? <laughs> Just in general? Yeah. <laughs> I tend to have less of the, I'm not certain if I should share this with you, and more of a, what are you analyzing about yeah. me right yeah. now? Sort of the panicked, you know, I'm trying to be funny or cute about this, but also I'm a little terrified you're seeing through my yeah. my head and my mind, and you're going to, you know, bring up some deep, dark secret or yeah. truth about me that I never thought anybody would know, which it yeah. always makes me laugh a little yep. bit. Quit looking at me. I know what you're yeah. thinking. No, you don't. <laughs> um, I enjoy your elevator pitches and your presentation because you talk about basically people of all ages mm -hmm. that, that come to you. Um, is there kind of a favorite age or anything like that that you kind of enjoy the most? Sure. So I've worked with ages about 18 months to my oldest client was in their 90s. And I, I've i got three different niches that I work with in. The tantrums and meltdowns, I really love having um, my kindergarten age and toddlers. Those are really, really great because we can get in early. We can make some big differences that allow us to get along at home and in school and um, as we're developing friendships moving forward. When we go into the realm of irrational fears and phobias, preteens is where I get a lot of work done there because that's where we know that this is a fear that's set in for a long time. It's not, you know, oh, I'm afraid of uh, the dark and I grew out of it, or I'm afraid of um, shots and I grew out of it. And this is really stuck with us. Um, so often that's where I'll, I'll have referrals for those sorts of things. And then the behaviors resulting from trauma, I tend to get a lot of older teens for that particular realm. Um, I get a lot of cases where there has been a separation in the family or something has occurred to the entire family or just the individual that has caused behavior patterns that don't allow the person to do the things that they wanna do in life or reach the goals that they've set for themselves. Now, I, sh I uh, make no bones about trying to bring up my grandkids in a, st in a show. And I was just telling Amnon before we came on the air, uh, Maggie, my one-year-old granddaughter was, uh, taking a shower with her mother the other day and her mother wanted her to do something. Maggie didn't want to do so. Maggie just headbutted the shower door. Um, they live in Charlotte, but, uh, otherwise I'd probably have them talk to you, but that's Maggie's. They call her Miss 100% because that's her only speed, right? I know you've seen that before. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I like about society today, I know it drives people nuts is uh, there are more and more people that have voices, whether it's social media or finally they can talk about things. Uh, minority voices in particular, uh, female athletes. I, I love that. And I know they drive people crazy. And my generation and my sex and my age are like, why don't they just shut up and play? But I, I love the way people have voices now. 
or is that making it easier for people to come to you and ask for help? That's a really interesting question. I'm not, I'm not certain if it makes it easier for people to come and ask for help. What I am certain of is we're starting to see a break in some of the stigmas from different behaviors, either the, I shouldn't report this having happened to me because there's a stigma that it happened to me, or I'm engaging in this behavior that I know I shouldn't. And there's such a big stigma that I'm unwilling to get the support to work through it. And so this world where we're seeing more diversity in voices, where we're seeing more experiences getting out into the world, we're seeing a lessening of stigma that's, that's slowly moving forward into perhaps an increased comfort for reaching out for help. Um, and also watching, it's interesting watching that across the pendulum swing of societal backlash and all those different things like you mentioned and seeing where, where we end up landing or settling um, as years move forward, I think will be really interesting, whether it will push into uh, an era of, you know, we all sort of constrict and get scared again, or our box has broken open, Pandora's box has let everything out, we can all take a breath and start to address things that have been an issue in our culture, society, and lives for a really long time. Are we hesitant to call you and professionals like you because we don't want to admit it, or we're maybe afraid of what we're going to learn? There's a couple of reasons people are afraid to call me in particular. One is that same, like, you're going to see something that I've been hiding for a long time before I'm ready for you to. Um, you're going to analyze my behavior and see something that I've been trying to hide for a very long time. Um, another piece that comes from that when I've got parents coming in is that I've talked to so many people. I've tried so many things. There's no way this will work. And I'm just tired of looking in the face of failure and going, I, I really want to support my child through this and nothing has worked so far. How on earth could this next thing work? So a lot of that comes down to a lot of shame. You know, how do I know that this is a piece of my reality that I'm in a really tough situation with a really tough behavior and how do I coincide with, how do I have that exist and coincide with, I'm still a good person or uh, my child is still worthy. Or I have, even though, you know, this opinion's coming forward or that opinion's coming forward, perhaps they've been kicked out of daycare or they're talking about expulsion from school. How do I have that and my love for my child at the same time? And will this person that I'm bringing in be able to hold those two truths as well? This is a, perhaps an abhorrent behavior and a genuinely good and worthy child or person that needs support in order to work through it. And it for parents, it's it's hard because we hear about, I mean, you've heard ad nauseum about the terrible twos, which I believe it should be called the threes because that's really when hell rained down on our house when our oldest one turned three, but that's neither here nor there. Sure. Uh, and you think that, oh, it's just a phase or a stage or a, you know, we'll do this, we'll do that. Is it usually an event that happens that get people to call you? It'll either be a holy smokes event, I never expected this to happen, or a I've tried everything and I don't know what else to do. Um, so sort of the examples of holy smokes events might be, I never expected my child to spit in my face. I never expected my teen to steal the car. I, um, I knew we would be okay until they did X and they just did X. Um, you know, I can handle this until I see that and we just saw that. Then on the other side, there's the uh, the sort of, and it's incredibly difficult to see the the uh, there's nothing I can do. I'm completely powerless in this, and I need help now, um, which is so tough because if I could get in a couple steps before that and be able to empower people before they hit that point, um, th they don't have to go through that that hurt moment and that terribly difficult moment before they make progress because you can make progress before you hit that point. But yeah, that, that sort of rock bottom, bottom hit or the um, something has happened that I, I'm going, whoa, this is way beyond uh, what I expected or am, am in the litmus test of is my life okay? It just failed that test and I, I want support now. And I would imagine you deal with spouses that disagree whether they should call you or not. Absolutely. Yeah, I have a lot because I work on the trauma side. I have a lot of families that are broken um, that have um, multiple adult caregivers involved across different settings and houses. 
there's sometimes um, legal requirements or court orders that are involved in in what we're doing. And there's a lot of different opinions and um, values to balance. And that's really important to say that we're balancing values here. It's not a situation generally of I'm just trying to stop you to stop you, but rather we have different value settings here. We're both trying to express those in the best way that we can in order to best care for this child. And they happen to not coincide. That can be a really, really tough situation. Yeah, it's again going back to just the K through twelve, and I you you can you can spread it out all over the place, but just K through twelve, and is it the crowd they get in? Is it their personality? Do they kind of get behind the eight ball? Maybe somebody's bullying them, and they and again that one I have no idea how to deal with, but I know there's all kinds of different things that start conversations with you. Sure. I think some of the scariest conversations that I have had recently are going to be the ones that have to do with technology. For example, um, Snapchat, Discord, Roblox, all those places where you can perhaps accidentally get in contact with adult strangers and have those those interactions not be uh, not be safe ones and turn into really unsafe situations. So that's that's been a really tough one to watch as it's evolved. Um, in the last couple of years, I'm definitely seeing more of that where someone was, their behavior was influenced by someone they had never met before online um, in an attempt to save face, um, like a blackmailing sort of situation, in an attempt to impress somebody or to be accepted into a group. All sorts of different things are happening. And it's it's really tough to see such a beautiful tool that is the connectedness of internet. Um, also be such a destructive tool at times. Is it, you know, we, we hear stories about parents that have a, a locator on their kids' phones. Just know, I think there's a plan that the whole family can know where they all are. Um, Absolutely. Is it, is it right to go back and look at our kids' browsing history? Is that going to give us insight if they don't share anything? I mean, how do we approach that? That's a really tough one. And again, we want to go back to values of the family because there's some families who from the very beginning say everything that you do on this device is going to be open to me, period. Like with full disclosure from the very beginning, we both understand what's going on here. Um, and there's going to be other families that say this is your private device. Use with it as you will. This is a part of your privacy. And what we're doing is we're creating relational frames around those things. Technology equals you know, this is adult monitored activity. That's the frame that I see my activity through or technology equals this is private. Therefore, I see it through that frame. And, you know, many things fall under private and many things fall under modulated by adults. Um, but by choosing and communicating the direction that the technology is going to be, you can get ahead of a lot of the disagreements on that. As far as going through and say sneakily checking up on stuff, I generally don't encourage that um, simply because you get into the can I trust you um, issue. And what that can turn into is, oh, you're going to sneak to check on me. So I'm going to sneak to make sure you can't check on me. And you can start reinforcing different behaviors that are incredibly intricate and unfortunately um, will work against you in being able to keep your child safe. So things like um, if you are secretly checking browser history, find something that you'd prefer they not be involved with, bring it up to them, and then they figure out history. That's how they found it. Now I know how to delete history. Now I know how to find specific things to delete. Um, so considering having that open conversation from the beginning, figuring out how to get ahead of some of those challenges, there's different apps. I believe I heard of one recently called Bark um, that can go through and look at everything that your child is involved in, again, telling them in the beginning, this is how this piece of technology is used. This is how it reports me. We're going to have this back and forth. We're going to be safe here. Um, can get ahead of a lot of that. Oh, I have to sneak around in order to access things. Yeah. And again, you know, having two boys that there was no technology back in the nineties, we didn't have to worry about that. I, that's, that's a whole nother world and that's just going to do Absolutely. nothing but grow legs. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's it's been really, really tough because there's so much access to so much information and very little context for being able to analyze and categorize that information in a healthy way. Yeah. 
Uh, tell me how you came up with clove hitch behavior. Sure. So the, the farm I'm on is clove hitch farm. Um, my husband and I both have backgrounds that have to do with tying knots. I have a, a ranching and farming background and the clove hitch knot is a knot that we used on the ranch and my husband was a sailor. So he has that background for tying knots. We were looking through how do we find something that for the farm that talks about flexibility, that talks about ability to change. And we found that that particular knot is used in both the sailing world and in the farming world and is all about adjusting and being able to be very strong, but being able to shift as needed. It seemed like the perfect fit for us. I like that. You yeah. have, uh, I do some professional stalking prior to the show. Just, you know, I want to come up with some, you know, some good stuff and learn, you know, mm -hmm. and laugh about the funny stuff that we all have and do in our background. Uh, you have an interesting mix of behavioral positions and roles and farm jobs. Yes. So when did the farm stuff start? Sure. So I was always interested in agriculture. My grandfather had a ranch in Texas that I grew up visiting. And as soon as I had the chance to, I, I was the kid that would bring home snakes and <laughs> Uh, injured bats and, you know, all the delightful stuff that your mom hopes you bring home. Yeah. Sorry, mom. Um, <laughs> you know, every, everything from injured butterflies to, to uh, large mammals. Um, it was, it was problematic in its own ways, but I was always interested in nature and in animals. And when I got into high school, I got involved in future farmers of America and really started to get a, a love for agriculture and recognizing its its basis for our our world to be able to work effectively and for us to be able to live healthfully. And with that, I I went forward and started working a number of different farms and ranches, everything from uh, polo clubs, um, taking care of the horses there and grooming. I raised hogs. I helped out at vets offices. Um, really anything I could get my hands on. And all through university, I was working at the ranch and picking up little odd jobs at different farms and just always, always found a way to have agriculture in my life, no matter what else I was doing. And it was a wonderful way to keep myself grounded through the tough times and to, to learn how to grow while growing, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. like growing plants, growing animals, growing health of the land is a, a fantastic way to mirror your own growth and to be able to, to see it through a different lens. And uh, who is residing on your property other than you and your husband these days? What kind of four-legged creatures you got with you? Sure. So I've got some, some four-legged, some two-legged, and some no-legged. <laughs> I've got um, two horses, Billy and Nancy. And then right now I'm, I'm seeing out my window the flock of geese we also have ducks, chickens, um, cat, a couple of barn dogs, a number of goats. And then we have uh, a pond that has uh, some giant goldfish in it. They're delightful. And um, every wild creature you can think of, copperheads, black snakes, blue-tailed skinks, um, just, just an absolute plethora of little critters. All right, so who and how names their horses Billy and Nancy? So Nancy, both both are, I'm hesitant to say rescues. I'm going to say adoptions mm -hmm. for both of them. So Nancy was originally named by her original owner, um, and I'm, I'm going through my head to make sure that I'm, I'm taking care of their privacy. Someone very near to them was named Nancy and passed away right before okay. she was born. And so she was named Nancy. And um, there, it was a, a really tough situation of this animal is a memorial for, for my past loved one. And I'm not sure if I can have my, this animal in my life. So it's a, it was a situation of um, they were unable to let go and they also needed, knew they needed yeah. to let go. So it took a couple of years for, for Nancy to um, fully be transferred over to me. And then Billy um, was, is originally a rescue situation. He was neglected down in um, Florida. He has a scar on his nose from where his halter grew into his face. He was um, emaciated. 
And when he escaped his situation, he um, got hit by a car, which is finally where animal control got a hold of him. And um, he lived with a couple other families along the way, but he's made it to us and he'll have our, his forever home with us. And they, they are such a hoot. Oh my goodness. They, they have funny names for sure, but they fit just perfectly. <laughs> And you use the animals in some of your therapy too, don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the ducks are really good about teaching about boundaries because they don't respect them unless you really <laughs> push for, I'd like a boundary here. Um, the geese as well. The geese would like you to respect their boundary and they're very clear if you come too close or do something they don't appreciate. Um, Billy, because he has that tough background, has some pretty um, big fear and anxiety responses like um, putting up a big show or trying to bite or kick you. If you, if you make an idea or rather make a movement toward you're going to take his food or you're going to take him away from a safe space at the same time, he's very playful and funny. So you've got a great, um, how do I come into this area and match my energy with his and help bring it down together, sort of practicing co-regulating um, with the goats. They are surprisingly large animals. It can be pretty intimidating and we can come in and find how gentle they can be while also keeping our own bodies safe. So they have horns. I have to watch out for my eyes. I have to read the situation and know when something's going to pop off, you know, two goats going for each other, not get in the middle of it and, and trust that these big animals can trust me and I can trust them that we'll take care of each other as long as we're being mindful of what's going on in the group and change our behavior and modulate sort of our energy as needed. And you were telling us earlier, you have a goat with a broken leg. I do. Yes. Miss Modine. Miss mm -hmm. Modine. Where does that name come from? So it's, it's a, a name from a show out of Canada that, that my husband and I used to watch called, um, uh, Sleater Kenny. Uh, no, getting that wrong. If I think of it, I'll tell it to you, that but it's works. a show out of Canada and, and one of the characters or rather one of the locations is called Modine's. Okay. And how does a goat with a broken leg get around? So what I did was I braced down under her foot all the way up to her shoulder. And that allows her to put weight on that leg um, without putting pressure on the broken spot. So we have really high hopes that it is setting correctly. So far, it looks great. We reset it. Um, yesterday after two weeks in, we're hoping to have her in another two weeks and then just go into bracing and rehabbing that shoulder. Okay. Uh, plans to add any more animals by the end of the year? We'll probably have another round of ducklings come through in the fall. Um, oh, we also have rabbits. We'll have rabbits coming through in the fall as well. As far as, um, like big groups of animals coming in or a new type of animal, absolutely not. We are building an office right now and I've got to focus in on that. <laughs> is that what you two, is that what you get each other every Christmas is an animal for the farm? No, goodness, no. <laughs> or people just drop them off. Hoarding very yeah. quickly. People just no, drop we, them off, don't they? <laughs> yeah, we, we both really like art. So it tends okay. to be art is our, okay. our gifts to All each right. other. Uh, so your husband's name is what? His name is Aaron. Aaron. All right. Uh, so how did you and Aaron meet and do you both tell the story the same way? Oh, goodness, no. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Okay. No, we, we tell it quite differently. It cracks me up because sometimes we'll tell it at the same time to someone who has asked and it and it's slightly different. Um, the the short answer is that we met at a coffee shop and then went out dancing. And um, we both lived in Durham at the time. And it was it was so much fun. And he was just lovely. And it's it was one of those situations of who would have thought two people from California would meet in Durham. And just happened to hit it off. You know, we, we grew up just a few hours away from each other and had to move across the country to meet each other. So it how, did, out pretty well. how did two people get a coffee shop and dancing story different? Well, the, the we met online originally. Okay. So that, that piece, sometimes one of us will leave out because, right. you know, it, it sounds more fun if you just say coffee shop and out dancing. But there are a bunch of people that have been on the show, met their spouse online. So it's mm -hmm. more and more. Uh, how long did you guys talk before you met at the coffee shop? Oh goodness. Uh, weeks to months. Yep. I I'm very much a, you know, let's take things slow sort of person. Um, you know, meeting people online, they, they could be anyone as yep. we, as we talked about earlier in the show today. 
Um, so I was very much take the time also recognizing, hey, you know, if we're going to go out dancing, let's first meet at a coffee shop. So if we go, oh, no, yeah. <laughs> this is not what we thought it was. It's an easy out. We finished our coffees. We can walk away. Um, so I very much am, am about how do we get ahead of potential challenges and stick with our values as we make choices through all of our relationships. And it makes it so much healthier if we can go about it that way. I'm happy to say that that was a way that I was able to to do so in that particular relationship. Uh, so when did you know things are like, ooh, I kind of like this? It's it, not too long after we started dating. He invited me to go camping for a week in the winter wow. in New York. And I went, okay, if we make it through to the winter <laughs> um, and you still want to take me camping, you know, in a tent yeah. in the winter in New York, um, then let's do it. And, you know, it was, it was a number of months before that came around. And by the time that came around, we both went, yes, this sounds like a great idea. Right. And the and, trip was um, fun. Pardon? The trip was fun. It was a blast. Good. It was just beautiful. We were in, um, sort of the, the, oh, what do you call it? The, all the gorges with all the waterfalls. The Finger Lakes region up north. Mm -hmm. the, the thing, yeah, up by Watkins Glen and Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Quite chilly. Did you um, think? Huh. Quite chilly. Yeah. And a little bit white on the ground, right? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And then a bit breezy. That's... And, uh, you know, it was an experience. The nights, uh, the first night, we definitely were a little less prepared than we thought we were. Um, but we survived. <laughs> yeah. And, and we're still here today. Uh, for the first date at the coffee shop, how many of your family and friends knew where you'd be and at what time should, should they not hear from you? I don't even recall how many, <laughs> but it was several. That's, you know, again, yeah. there's, when we're talking about mixing online with real life, yep. precaution, 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 and that equals safety. There's not, there's not a lack of romance with precaution. It's just, how do I do this in the best way possible? Yep. So absolutely, multiple people knew where I was, where I was going, all the plans through, because, yep. you know, always better to be safe. I have uh, four nieces, and three of them are out of college, one's a junior, and I gave them all the same advice uh, with regards to guys in college. Uh, don't believe anything a college guy tells you. And second of all, make him ask you out twice, because mm -hmm. if he really, really wants to go out with you, he'll ask twice. We will chase. If there's a woman or a somebody we want to meet, we will like, how about today? How about today? So they followed yeah. that advice and they, you know, so, but yeah. Uh, one of your other cool jobs, I don't think many people, you don't talk about much during your elevator pitch, is you were a Napa auto parts delivery driver. I was indeed. Yep. I was um, after I had earned my master's. This, this is what you do after you earn a master's. <laughs> um I was working at the family ranch and again, I'm, I'm going through, you know, the privacy of other people involved in stories. Um, it, it became very clear that as a female, it was not my place to take over the family ranch that I would need to be married and that he would take over the ranch. And at that point in my life, it was, you know, and it's just generational differences. Mm -hmm. oh, it's, yeah. it's just the way it goes. Um, but I recognized, Oh, this is not, this is not a place for me right now. And that breaks my heart. What in the world do I do now? And so I moved back to my college town and I started delivering car parts and, you know, going to car shows and holding trophies and, and driving car parts all around Texas and the whole nine yards just to go. I need to completely focus on what does it mean to be me now? Because that was something, you know, taking over the ranch and having all these these um, big plans and ideas was a lot of what I had made into myself. And so when that was no longer an option, a big piece of what I considered me sort of flew away. And by taking a job that was pretty straightforward and I could do fairly easily and didn't take a lot of brain power, I was able to go, okay, how do I, how do I find me again? And part of that was um, playing roller derby. Part of that was making new friends. Part of that was exploring what the next thing in my career would be. But yeah, Napa Napa Auto Parts was definitely a big step in my uh, in, in my uh, career. 
And um, not something that I usually bring up in elevator pitches. That's absolutely true. Yeah. So let's go back to the roller derby. I need to hear more about this in future meetings because uh, you piqued sure. my interest. Uh, my guess is you were one of those smiling assassins, right? <laughs> you kind of walk up, hey, how you doing? Laugh. And next time you come by me, I'm laying down and seeing stars, right? Yeah, I, I played, um, mostly played a position called the jammer, which mm -hmm. wears a little star on their helmet. They're the, the one that scores the points for the team. Yep. So it's a lot of like juking through. Um, and then I would occasionally play some other positions, but I, I, I was fairly quick. Um, I was good at getting through, uh, difficult situations. And if somebody, you know, slammed me pretty hard, I could stand back up and keep going. Okay. Um, which were all good traits for that particular position. Nice. How long did you do that? I did that in Texas, gosh, for a year, maybe two, and then a little bit in Colorado. Um, I was hoping to join a team out here in North Carolina. I've just never been able to find a team near enough to where I was at um, to be able to, to get that done. So you could lace up some uh, blades right now and give us a Give us a good run for our team. Oh my gosh. I love roller skating. I always say that my, the little town I'm in Franklinton just needs a roller rink. Yep. That's, that's all we need. And then we'll be complete. Well, that's your next business. That, you know, it's a joke and it's not a joke. I know. I know. I'm with you. I bet there's land. Somebody would do that. Cause you know, it would go over. Well, the world's oh moving goodness, that yes. way. So yeah, you won't have, you won't, there'll be no shortage of families wanting to skate. Uh, Absolutely. So schooling wise in no particular order, I believe you started out at Texas A&M. I did indeed. And then it was Florida Institute of Technology and then Shriner? Other way around. Okay. So Texas A&M for my bachelor's, Shriner for my master's um, in teaching certificate, and then Florida Institute of Technology for my um, behavior analyst certification okay. courses. Uh, you probably had to take a few tests along the way. Are you in general a good test taker? I, in general, am a good test taker unless spelling is involved. Um, I'm mildly <laughs> dyslexic. Um, th words like country and county, I have to take my thumb and go across them to be yep. able to tell the difference. Um, so if, if spelling counts, it's going to be a tough day. It's going to be a real tough day. Otherwise, I do pretty well. Would you have preferred the test where there were three questions? It was all essay. You have an hour ago. Oh, yeah. I, I'm a chatter. Yeah. I will, I will chat about it. I will argue both <laughs> sides. Um, I love taking things from different frames, which I think is part of why I'm good at my job. I can, I can look at things and go, but what if I believe yeah. this? I could see you debating yourself during that one hour, writing stuff down to your professors oh, yeah. going, Kelly, what's going on here? <laughs> yes. I, I had a number of professors that greatly enjoyed me as a student. And mm -hmm. I have a number that were vocally unhappy yeah. with, um, with working with me as a student. And it's, it's in those moments I was incredibly insecure and you know, why don't you like me? The people pleaser side was really having a tough time. And I recognize now that that's allowed me to meet students that are feeling that sort of same thing. I have this behavior that makes it really hard for my teacher and my teacher has been vocally um, unhappy with having me as a student and go, okay, yeah, honey, I've been there. Um, that's, I know it doesn't make you bad. I know this is just a challenge in your behavior and I can empathize through because I have been there. Yeah. And that's, I think I can say it this way. That's a, that's a them problem, meaning that's a teacher problem. If they keep doing mm -hmm. that, which means they were probably taught that way and they do it that way every year. And like, well, I've been working here 22 years and that's tough on this. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a tough one too, Mike. And this is where I'm doing that same thing where I'm like, yeah, of course it's the teacher problem because you're the adult in the situation. Stand up, let's go. And the other side is like, hey, even as an adult, you don't deserve to be hit in the face, mm. have a desk thrown at you. You yeah. don't deserve to have a child grab your scissors and try to stab you. Um, so there's there's the piece of behavior is really tough at times. And that doesn't make the person bad, but it can make the behavior unacceptable. And again, how do we hold those two truths? And the behavior of the adult counts as well. You know, it's not just about the behavior of the child, it's the behavior of the adult. And where is that acceptable and unacceptable? And does that, it doesn't affect your worthiness as a human. It's just how do we work through this and make it better? And I appreciate the clarification. Um, I just didn't, I, you know, I graduated high school in 79 and I don't recall any of that. Now, maybe sure. because I had blinders on or, you know, but I, 
I don't recall any of that. So. Well, I think that's a really important thing to talk about. So we, we've got to remember, too, that institutionalization was much bigger in our past, that we have worked so much for integrating classrooms and all these different things and allowing more people into the greater population of the world, which is so fantastic. And we need more support to make sure that they can be successful in those spaces. And expecting people to go in with the same skill set and not have the support and do, you know, the same just as well, quote unquote, be normal, which honestly, what is normal and who would want to be in the last place. But looking through at that and seeing, oh, we've worked really hard for, for integrating everybody, making sure we all have access to mainstream as much as possible. And we haven't provided them the support that they need to be able to succeed in those situations is really tough. Um, you'll see that a lot too when we look at um, like oh there was there was nobody um, autistic when I was younger. Yep. Okay. Well, there was high levels of institutionalization. There's been big changes in the diagnostic criteria, and just in general, we're seeing more people meeting that criteria. Whether or not the the criteria had changed, they wouldn't have met before um, at the current criteria. That's it's we're we're seeing more people being affected. By neurodivergence and um, our world isn't changing fast enough to support so much diversity in in brains it's it we're still very stuck in this is what um a classroom should look like this is what uh a workplace should look like and that can be really really tough when you have an increasing diversity increasing needs but not increasing support yeah and i'm starting to hear more and more parents mention that one of their kids is and i think if i've got this right what i usually hear is I have a child that's, is it on the spectrum? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, uh, again, back to your point, unheard of 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. So I'm glad on that. Um, I always like to give at the end of the show, just give people something to think about. And I I can't, I I don't want to do your profession injustice by saying, Hey, here's a black, white answer. Give me a question. Give me yes, no answer. But if somebody just has a thought of, I just, would like to talk to someone. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Other than you, and we've been putting Kelly's number on here, so please reach out to her. But what are kind of next steps if they feel like, I I think I'm ready to talk to someone about this? Sure. So there's a bunch of different resources you can go out to. If you're looking, hey, I think I want to have an assessment for a diagnosis. Um, One of my favorite referrals is going to be Dr. Scarce. Um, Suzanne Scarce, she's out of North Raleigh. She's phenomenal. That's all she does. She does a really good job differentiating between neurodivergence and trauma. Um, so that's going to be my, my big referral for assessments. If you're just looking for providers and going, hey, I, I want to know what's out there. Um, Psychology Today is going to be phenomenal. You can search by your insurance. You can search by your area. You can search for specific age groups or certain types of therapy. There's all sorts of different ways that you can hone that, that down. Um, and look through. As far as other behavioral supports, you can go, if you're looking, hey, I've got a child and I really want ABA therapy, um, applied behavior analysis therapy, which at this point I'm, I'm kind of, for the classic ABA therapy, I'm kind of on the edge of that. I don't provide um, your classic ABA therapy anymore. Going to BHCOE, um, Behavior Health Center of Excellence, That is a a certification board that goes through different ABA companies and goes, hey, are they uh, at a level of excellence that we can certify them above the board? So going through and going, hey, they they are way above the basics as far as how they're caring for people, how they're caring for their staff, the way they're staying on top of technologies. Um, So if you're looking for an ABA company, I would definitely check there. We appreciate that. And folks, we've been putting Kelly's number up on the screen during the show. Uh, If you have any questions, please give her a call, whether it's about you, your parents, or your kids. Um, Just again, just ask. Asking is free. It's a great, just a lot of times when we want to do something, we hold ourselves back when the first thing we do, just just start. Because people go, well, what should I do first? Well, just start. You know, ask the right people, the right questions, and kind of see where that goes. So uh, appreciate the education on your world, which is, uh, ever changing and, you know, and we no idea where it goes, but yeah, the technology part of it can be very scary. So I'm sure you have heard your fair share of stories on that. But, uh, anyways, if anybody is out in the Franklin and Youngsville area on Wednesdays around lunchtime, there's always a pretty good food truck out in front of the gun club, right? 
so Absolutely. they can get a good meal, come meet some professionals and some some sales professionals and business owners and see what they can do for you, help you with your business. And Kelly, always enjoy the time. Love the story. The roller derby. I always put a little note. Uh, what's my takeaway? Um, the the knot, the name of your company, Clove Hitch, it's a knot. But yeah, the roller derby. We'll be You and I will be talking more about that. I will want to know more because I used to watch it on TV, could never skate, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. So. Well, Mike, anytime you want to learn to skate, just let me know. I don't have a back for that anymore. 30 years ago, I could have, but not today, but I appreciate it. So uh, anyways, Kelly, thanks for everything. Good luck with everything. And we will see everybody next time on Triangle B&I. tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.